Hello everyone, my name is Gabriel Fletches. I'm a second year graduate student here at Colorado School of Mines in the Mechanical Engineering Department. And I'm here today to talk to you about my work on cross laminated timber building energy model for the 2021 grad symposium. So without further ado, let's jump into it. Our path through the presentation today is gonna to touch on five major areas. We'll address what goes into making a well-designed building, what cross-laminated timber actually is, if this is something that you're not, uh, if it's something that you're not familiar with. We'll address, talk about the study objective and my current progress on the work, as well as where this project is going. A well-designed building controls two major things, and in doing so, affects a third. It keeps water out, keeps comfortable air in and controls air transfer throughout through the building, and it keeps the people inside of the building comfortable. The first two categories, keeping water out and controlling air transfer, are largely functions of the building envelope. We'll touch on the building envelope several times throughout this presentation. And all that is, is the walls and the ceiling and the windows, and really what you have a mental picture of when you think of a building. Maintaining comfort has more to do with the HVAC system and is where most of your energy that goes to the building is actually used in, in um, making cool, comfortable air in the summer and warm air in the winter. Now, when we're looking at trying to address climate change and reducing energy consumption, the built environment is a big target. Buildings consume an immense amount of energy. And in the United States, 76% of all electricity generated goes to buildings. And when you roll up oil and gas into the mix, 40% of all US energy production goes toward buildings. Now, when it comes to making a well-designed building, cross-laminated timber is a good candidate for material use. CLT makes for a tighter building envelope than a building traditionally, or, or a more traditional construction with concrete and steel. When I say a tighter envelope, I just mean there's fewer cracks and gaps in throughout the building structure that air can unintentionally leak in and out of. So there's possibility for energy savings through this improved envelope tightness. For smaller buildings, CLT would give the structure more thermal mass than a traditional wood framing construction would. This should improve the comfort of the building for its occupants by reducing temperature fluctuations. And then in warm climate allows for improved pre-cooling strategies. And that's something that is useful for demand response, uh, uh, demand response management for electric grids. From a waste standpoint, CLT buildings produce less waste than a traditionally constructed building. They're largely able to do this through prefabrication the door and window holes are cut out of the large CLT panels, and when they arrive on site, they're bolted together. From start to finish, these buildings produce less waste in the process than a alternative construct, uh, a traditional construction. Now, for all of these advantages, why don't we see more CLT buildings? You know, when you're driving around downtown Denver, you're going to see lots of steel and concrete structures going up. Well. There's a few barriers. From a research standpoint, most of that has focused on characterizing CLT, cross-laminated timber, as a material, but hasn't really looked at its influence as a component in larger systems like buildings. As a building material, it's more expensive than concrete and steel. This can make it not cost competitive with concrete and steel. The reason you do see some CLT buildings starting to crop up is that there are energy savings in other areas. It takes about half of the amount of people to actually make the whole structure. They can also build the structures faster. I think it reduces construction time anywhere from one third to about a half of a concrete and steel building. And they're also quieter. And so in urban settings, that can be a benefit in just being less disruptive to the uh, people around where the new building is going up. So it's a give and a take uh, that the cost component has hindered larger use. We're unsure of how our current modeling tools accurate, uh, simulate CLT buildings. 
Our current building modeling tools have been built around concrete steel structures because that's most of what everything is made out of. Um, the uncertainty in how well we're able to model a CLT building is in part because the properties of wood change as the moisture content of wood changes. In CLT buildings, most of the wood in the structure is actually exposed inside, um, in part for aesthetic reasons, uh, and it uh, has surface finishes, so there's no reason to really cover it up. The coating on them is water vapor permeable, though, so there's opportunity for water to transfer from the air into the structure itself. And we're not sure how that's going to affect the energy predictions and interior, uh, interior predictions for building energy models. So that's where we come into it. Our study is looking to validate the capability of current building energy modeling tools, such as OpenStudio, which I'm using in this work, to accurately simulate cross-laminated timber buildings. Now, we're briefly, uh, to, to take a pause, what is building energy model? If it, this was something I wasn't familiar with three years ago, essentially it's a detailed, often transient heat and transfer model of a building. It doesn't have to be transient um, or where you, you actually model the, the structure through time. You could have a reduced order model in Excel that gives you an annual energy prediction for a building. However, what we're looking at in this study is one that it's going to predict sub-hourly conditions of the building over the course of a year. The details that it accounts for are the local climate, people coming in and out of the structure throughout the day, the actual materials that have gone into putting the building together, as well as the specific HVAC systems inside of it. You can use building energy modeling to predict energy consumption and the conditions of a building if you make a change. So if you have a model for an existing building, you can make changes in the model and that can be used as a way to see how maybe changing all of the lighting throughout the building or using a different HVAC system is going to affect the energy use of the building. Our study is divided into four main tasks. We're going to collect data from real CLT buildings and use it to build a data set that decision makers can use in assessing if they want to make a CLT building. We're developing baseline energy models of these buildings, and then we're going to use that data to validate the building energy models. And as a final step, we'll look at trying to optimize the operation of the buildings, accounting for the CLT that's in them. In our presentation today, we're going to focus on task, my work in task two. Up to this point, I've focused on developing the first building energy model in OpenStudio. On the left here, you can see it represented in SketchUp. This is an educational building located in the Denver metro area. It has about 23,000 square feet of floor area, and its construction finished early 2019. This has actually been one of the challenges in our study is we don't actually have a full year of normal operating data for any of these buildings. And so in trying to compare our early models to, to the real buildings, it's hard to make a clear comparison when they're not being operated the way that they were designed to be. When you make a building energy model, you have to start with the building geometry and so that's what you see here on the left is the, rendi uh, or the rendering of the building in SketchUp. And by geometry, this is just where all of your walls and your windows are in the building. You need to input the specific properties that have gone into the walls and the windows and the floors. You need HVAC equipment characteristics. So in some buildings, you have a little heater and cooler inside of each room, and in others you have a central system that blows air into all spaces, and that's often more common, and that's what is the case in this educational building. And then you need to adjust your algorithms and settings. This is one of the most important steps as a modeler, is understanding how different algorithms and settings are going to affect the quality of your model and its ability to mimic what you're trying to, to model from real life. 
my work still has a long way to go. What you're looking at here is a 12 month calendar year, and this was simulated using 2019 weather data. And it's the energy use being predicted by the building model in the dark blue bars, and then the actual energy used by the building in 2019 and the light blue bars. We can see at the end of the year here that the model isn't too far off from the actual energy consumption. And what we would be targeting is about within 10% uh, for each month. But in the summer, the model is predicting much higher energy use than the building actually consumed in that year. So the target for the research right now is trying to look into how the model is, is cooling and trying to improve how well the cooling system mimics the actual building's cooling system. Another way to look at this is with temperature. In the dark blue line is real space temperatures for the building, and this was actually for last week, April 7 to 13. And then in the orange line is how the model predicts the temperature for the same space over that same time frame. So we can see that the model is predicting that the building is warmer than it actually was, and at the peak of the day appears to warm up before cooling down throughout the night and has this pattern of, of rise fall that we don't see in the real data. The next steps that we're going to be taking is developing a model for the second building in this study, and it's an office building that's adjacent to the educational building that we were just looking at. We're comparing different heat and mass transfer models within the software to see how they affect the predictions of the model. We're in the process of putting sensors on these buildings so that we can get real-time energy use from the buildings and use that to compare to our model. As we get real-time energy use, that's going to allow us to better tune the current model. We're setting up automated data extraction out of the building management systems. This is going to give us inf uh, data on the temperature in different spaces throughout the structures, as well as relative humidity. And hopefully within the next year, we have some tun tuned up models that we can use to begin running case study analysis and looking at the influence of the construction um, on the building performance and its energy use. I'd like to give a big thank you to the U.S. Forest Service that's supporting this work, as well as my team in the Amber Lab, Dr. T Paulo Tabares, Mohammed, Carl, and Matt. They've all been pivotal in helping me get my feet under myself on this work, and I've appreciated all of their support and mentorship. Thank you for your time.